Today on Lessons from Last Time, I'm bringing on my good buddy, Josh Pitts. And Josh Pitts is the owner of Shred Media, and he's got a couple other cool things going on, all that have the word shred in them. Um, but he's just super committed to the mortgage industry. He's big all over social media. He's done a ton of video. One of the guys I really respect for his content creation within the industry. So uh, here we go. Let's meet my buddy, Josh Pitts. This week on the podcast, I get to talk to, I, I'm just gonna say it, one of my best friends, uh, Josh Pitts. And it's so funny because the uh, we, Allison started this last week, uh, my new assistant here at the Knowledge Cube. And it's funny cause she's like, you. so I'm trying to di differentiate buddy, friend, best friend, love that dude. Like I have all these different categories for people and it's gotta be hard cause I think everybody's a great friend, but you and I have gone through some stuff together um, and we haven't even known each other super long, but there's a there's a Josh Pitts that I think the, the industry knows um, based on what you've put out there. And then there's a Josh Pitts that I've gotten to know, which is uh, a much deeper side of life, starting with the empty bookshelves behind you. Yeah, dude, first and foremost, I'm humble. And I, I dude, I call you a best friend for sure. You're one of those guys that in the mortgage industry, in the industry that we're in, like you're one of those people that I, I count on. Like you, when something goes to the shits, you're one of the first guys I call. Like, I'm like, I got to call Ken. Like, I got to talk, talk to him. I got to talk through this. I've talked to you about so many business decisions and things like that. So you are that like friend to me. So I'm truly grateful for you and for having me on here. But yeah, the bookshelves, I am, uh, we're going through a huge change. Me and my family, um, we recently took a trip to Costa Rica, spent like three and a half weeks down there and uh, decided that the world, there was so much more the world had to offer. And I love, I, Utah has been home. Utah has been, my, I love the outdoors. I love spending time in nature. That's why we moved up to the ranch we're on now. But after going to Costa Rica and having my kids experience the real world, as like I like to call it, um, I was like, why, why are we, why are we holding ourselves back from this? Like, why, why don't we go out and experience the world and all that it has to offer? So my wife's like, let's do it. She's my wife homeschools the kids. She does a brilliant job with it. So she's like, we can go anywhere we want. So we're actually going on, uh, as I've shared with you, we're going on a road trip. We're going to do a little RV trip around the country and then ultimately buying a sailboat. And we're going to go spend a few years in the Caribbean sailing around and just having experiences that we will never forget as a family. So, uh, but dude, I'll tell you what, this, this in particular, uh, the sale of our house has been uh, being in the mortgage and in real estate, you kind of know how the process has been. There's been this investor buying our house. And it has been one of the most roller coaster of emotions because he's like, yes, we're closing. I told you we were supposed to close like two months ago. And it just has been keep getting like put off and put off and put off. And then we literally listed our house last weekend because the whole deal fell apart, like fell apart. Hey, not going to happen. And we're like, oh my gosh. So we scrambled, got the house on the market. And then the guy comes back and he's like, "Never mind, I'm ready to go. I got the money. We can close." And so we're closing next week. By the time this is out, it will have closed. But yeah, dude, go talking about roller coaster emotions, moving and gonna go on an adventure. Have you, as each of those things has happened that has delayed this process, or you know, maybe had you concerned that this might not even be a thing that you're selling your house? Are you? Is your family just like, let's all get together and let's just like get through this? Is it definitely bonding time, or is there like? you know, some of the, well, if we would have done this or if we had done that, is it like, you know, how have you processed that? So my wife, that's, I have to give her, Cassidy has been, she's always been my rock, but through this in particular, just because we've had so much going on with Shred, with Shred Growth, with our Shred U community, with us to about, to, about to become a SaaS company, releasing Shred It, uh, which has been huge for us. There's been that plus moving and cast through the whole entire thing. Plus my kids, my kids are just kind of like, they, they go with the flow. They're just like, hey, whatever happens. And so watching their positivity is like, hey, if it's gonna happen. And you and I kind of share the belief, everything happens for a reason. And my wife keeps reminding me of that. Like, hey, you know, everything happens for a reason. Stay positive through this. We have each other. Like we're still in a very, we're still very, very blessed to have everything that we have. So stay patient through this. It's going to happen when it's supposed to happen. Um, and what's really funny, Ken, is like, even the last couple of trips. So I, I went on a trip to Detroit. I was speaking at an at a industry event. And uh, on Tuesday, when I flew out to the event, I was in the airport and my nephew, who is serving a two-year uh, church mission for, for the LDS church, he was at the airport. And I 
I knew, but I didn't know we were going to run into each other. And between you and I, like he had been really struggling. His family had been going through some stuff and he had been like, his anxiety was through the roof. And I ran into him and I kid you not, the embrace that him and I had at the airport, just by happen chance, I'm going to my terminal or going to my gate. I see him and I'm like, no way. And again, he's about to leave two years, leave his family, leave everything behind. The embrace that him and I had, I knew that moment. I knew for a fact that moment was supposed to happen and the delay of my house, that was just part of it. Like, I'm just like, this was supposed to happen. I was supposed to be here for this kid and just give him a a hug and give him some advice that I had learned during my time. And so uh, it's been little things like that that have kind of reminded me that puts everything in perspective for you. It's like, man, as much as, as, as frustrating as it's been for me to go through this process of selling the house and yes, it's going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. Yes, it's going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. And then the little things between one other thing. So it's my son's birthday this weekend and his, this is his final wish for his birthday was that he would have his, his ninth birthday in this house and it's going to happen now. Like, and he was just telling us this morning, like I get to have my birthday. That's the one thing. I don't wanted to have before we went on this amazing adventure is one more birthday in this house. So it's funny, Ken, because it's, like I said, it's frustrating as, you know, I have super high anxiety. So as, as anxious I've been to this whole thing, it's been little, I don't know if you call them miracles. I don't know if you call them just happen chance, but little things like that, that have put everything into perspective. Dude, that's, I mean, the, the whole concept of lessons from last time is pulling out these lessons. You just gave one right out the gate which is look for those things that like, okay, if this is painful, what's it for? Like, what am I going to get out of this that I would have missed had this not been painful? Right. And I, I can, I can picture you like running into this kid and like just being the one he needed to see that day. Like, but that doesn't happen. So you need that struggle because it isn't always just about that struggle. It sounds like it's about what else is in there and your, your boy being there for his birthday. That's super cool. Dude, it, it's so funny because that it really was, it wasn't for me. Like it was, it was purely for my nephew when I ran into him and I didn't even know it until it happened. And I was mm-hmm. like, again, I knew the, the situation going into it. And uh, it's amazing how I'm, I mean, depending on your faith and depending on your beliefs, I think we're, we're used it, you know, in, in a much greater plan outside mm-hmm. of our own. Like, and I, and I'm a huge, huge believer that, you know, we, we have opportunities and we have situations that, that occur within our own life, not just for us, but usually it's for the benefit of others. Mm -hmm. And so anytime I can see that, because dude, this has been painful. Like there, there have been nights where my wife has seen me just like pissed. I mean, fuming, just why, like why, you know, we've, we've done everything on our side. We've, we've worked hard. We've got the house ready. We put the work into it. We spent the money. We spent the time. We've, we've done everything we could possibly can. Why is this not happening? Like, why can't we catch a break here? Every, the world is against me. The universe is against me. Just give me one freaking break here. That's all I need. And then you have these things happening. You're like, okay, I guess, you know, it's, uh, it's not all about me. It's, uh, it's about the people around me. Dude, I think both of us, the story of our lives is finding out it's not all about us over and over and over. <laughs> it's true. So you, you, I've only known you at Shred, right? We didn't know each other before, before Shred. So when did that start? What year? Five years ago. We were, Five years ago. It's, yeah. Before that, you had a lot of different careers. I know you were in mortgage, but you didn't, that wasn't all you did. Um, so I, I got in mortgage 2010. And so I've been, so I own a mortgage company, but I've had throughout the mortgage company, so I got started as an LO, partnered in a mortgage company. When I was a partner in a mortgage company, I actually owned an outdoor company, uh, owned, owned an archery shop. So as, as you know, art, outdoors, archery, hunting uh, was a huge passion of mine, huge passion of mine. Um, and one of my buddies convinced me, he's like, dude, we should start an archery shop deal. We should start an outdoor company together. So I'm like, yeah, let's do like, that sounds amazing. Mixing business with pleasure. What, what could be better than that? Like the two things I love, I love business. I love being outside. Like let's combine them. So we started going down that route. We actually ended up buying a small, another small archery company and kind of making it our own. And then that was, I would probably say when it comes to turmoil and like the heart, probably one of the hardest times of me and my family's life, that was it. Because now I'm spending time in the mortgage company. 
it, when as soon as I leave, leave the mortgage company, I'm going over to the archery shop helping our and I have I have a manager, I have uh, a bunch of employees working that. And as you well know, employees throw everything like <laughs> as much as we love them and we try to trust them and we uh, we don't want to micromanage them. When it comes to retail in particular, it's it's all about margin. It's all about the littlest things. And we found that out so quickly that even when, if it's, if it's not yours, if it's not your baby and you hire somebody to control your baby and take care of your baby, they will never take care of it the way you want it to be taken care of. Like, you, it doesn't matter if you, if you trust them, if you pay them well, they will never have that same respect and that same amount of care and love for that baby. And that's what we found very quickly is that employees, they were giving discounts here and there. products started to disappear. Uh, and then after just struggling, struggling for about three years with that, we finally had to call it quits. It had just, it had gone so far into the ground. We ended up trying to bring on other partners. My original partner, we had to kick him out because he was, he was, he was taking from the company as well. So I'm like, dude, you're out. Uh, brought in another guy. We found very quickly that he, same thing. He didn't have the best interest in mind. He was selling product outside the, outside behind like backdoor stuff that was just sinking it. And we just kept seeing money pour into this thing. And next thing I know is me and my wife are like, we have to shut this down. Like, and it, what it was so brutal is we had built a reputation. Like my name was on this thing. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we have to shut this down. And the Utah archery community is very, very small very small. It's, it's very small across the country. Next thing I know is I'm the guy like, Oh, Josh Pitts, like he's shutting down one of the, you know, this archery shop because, and it, dude, what's crazy is you really start to find a lot about who your real friends are because all these rumors start flying. It's, Oh, he's been, Josh has been stealing from the company. Him and his wife mm -hmm. have been, you know, stealing off the top. Like, and it's all because of them, because of their greed and da, da, da. I'm like, Whoa, whoa, like look at the real picture, ladies and gentlemen. Like our employees are stealing from us. You as our our um patrons are stealing from us. You're coming in, you're not paying when you're showing up. So it just it just went bad so quickly. And having failed as a business owner, so we had to we we basically said, Okay, we're shutting down. Um, we ended up bringing in a partner last second where he came in and kind of bailed us out. He was he had, a, he had, fortunately he was, he's pretty well off and he's like, Hey, you know, I'll help all you guys out instead of you guys declaring bankruptcy, you can pay me back. But I had lost, we, that's when we had to move. Like we had to sell the house. Like we just, like everything just went crazy at that point. And I'm just like, dude, this sucks. So, so yeah, before I started doing shred, that was my experience was going into that. But you were, so you're running a mortgage company at this point yep. and you decide let's do this other thing too. Um, and I know yep. you're, we're pretty similar in a lot of different areas, right? And one area is every idea sounds awesome. And so you found an awesome idea, which sounds like you were super passionate about. Everything sounds great. Did you, had you thought about like, how does this end? Or was this like, let's just jump into this experience and see what it's like. Cause it seems awesome. Dude, I jumped into it. You know me, like when I, something like, and my wife is more like, Hey, let's think through this. What is the end game with all of this? And I'm like, no, Oh, babe, we'll figure it out as we go. It's going to be amazing. Let's just go for it. And uh, yeah, I had no idea. It's funny because we, as we started the company, um, my wife's even like, well, you know, Blue Sky, do you stop doing mortgages and ultimately come over here? Like, is that your goal? And I'm like, don't worry, babe, we'll figure it out. Let's just keep going. Let's just do this. Let's go. Hey, thinking along. about these things. Come on. Yeah, like, ah, who cares? Like, we're just going to, we're going to go make big money in mortgage and in this outdoor world. And that was a the problem. There was no plan. There was no, um, it wasn't even lack of execution. Uh, I was, it was purely from not being able to, not being able to control what was happening on the day to day. Like I said, I, I was in the mortgage company. That was my focus. That was my baby. That was what was, that's what was paying to keep the, the archery shop open was the mortgage company. And, uh, yeah, they just came to a point where like, can't keep doing this anymore. It's, it was so mentally and emotionally taxing on me and my wife that we're just like, we, if nothing else, we're losing money hand and fist, but we have to stop doing this because this just, I, I wasn't sleeping at night. I, I couldn't focus on the mortgage company. Even my partner came to me. He's like, dude, you got to choose. Like this isn't working. So how did your, I was just gonna ask, how did, how did your wife deal with that? Knowing that she originally was thinking, let's think this through, you dove into it. 
did you carry that failure or did she stand beside you? I mean, it's got to be hard to be her and like having chased a dream with you and then having the dream not work out. Dude, my wife is a saint. She has watched me chase multiple dreams and she is always... And now as we've approached some of our other, like even shredded as we're going into the SaaS world of, uh, of, of that industry and things as we pursued, she's, she's very, she's patient and loving in the way of reminding me of some of our past experiences. Like, Hey, remember the archery company? Let's think through this next idea before we go into it. We got into NFTs for a short time and that was a huge failure. And she's like, Hey, before we jump into some of these, like, let's just really think through it. She's always supported me. She's always been by my side. She's always been, she's always championed them too. She's like, hey, if you think this is like, if you want to do this, if you want to pursue this, I am by your side the entire time. Um, and she's always, she's always been part of our businesses. She ran the books for our archery company and she was the first one to notice. She's like, hey, something's not right here. Like one plus one is equaling zero. So something is wrong. Like we got to figure this out. And uh, she's always been an incredible judge of character. I've had some past partners in, in different ventures that, she always knows, right? Like right at the giggle, like, Hey, something's not quite right here. Like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, you and I share the same, uh, I don't know if it's a challenge or a struggle and we are very trusting people. <laughs> like we just, we want to see the best. We, we want, like, you see somebody and you're like, no, they're amazing. Like they're going to be, a, they're going to do awesome for our company. They have our best interest in mind. And then come to find out it's like, no, they don't <laughs> like, not even like I was told wrong on those people. So, you know, my wife, she supported me and, and of course it's been a struggle for her. There's been a lot of ups and downs, but that's one thing that, I mean, through it all, my family has been my biggest support. They've always been there through the thick and the thin, the, the highs and the lows. And, and I now even, especially as we've got, as we have, have approached this new adventure as a family, that's been the biggest thing is, are we all on the same page as a family? Because this isn't just like we're moving down the road. This isn't just moving to a new town or a new city. This is literally uprooting everything and not just going in an RV for a couple of months, but it's literally buying a sailboat and going on the open ocean. It's just, yeah. So if I didn't have the support of my, of my wife in particular and, and the kids, I couldn't have got through any of it. All right, I want to go into something you just talked about because it's it is uh, something that plagues me as well. I love everybody, and uh, I just it was so funny. I was going to hang out with some guys, and uh, my buddy calls and he's like, "Hey, this guy is really excited to hang out with you," and I'm like, "Oh, cool." And he goes, "No, no, you don't understand. He doesn't like anybody." And so I was like, "How do you not like anybody? I like everybody." It's so, like there's a spectrum, right? There's a spectrum of we all know that person that doesn't like anybody, and you have to prove yourself a million times before they give you a chance. And then there's you and me, where if I meet you on the street, I'll be like, you're the best human ever. Like there's, it's just an immediate love of humans. Do you think there's a way we can find balance in that? Or do you even want to find a way to find balance? Because personally, I feel like I don't want to look at people with like, and like you're suspect, right? But I think there's probably a little better filter maybe, or what do you think? Dude, I agree with you. I, I like to see the best because here's it the world is such a negative and there's so much doom and gloom and so much sorrow and heartache in the world. I want to give people the best, like the benefit of the doubt. Like even the people that I've heard from other, like, Oh my gosh, this, this person, like you got to watch out for them. And I meet them. I'm like, they're awesome. Like, what do, why do they, people think he's, he's, this person is such a bad person. And then of course you get to know them. You're like, Oh, maybe there was some truth in that. I, I, I think people, and I really mean this because my wife still asks me to this day, I'll meet somebody and we actually just met a, another recent, part, somebody who we were going to partner with. And she's like, hey, let's really like, before we get into this, let's really take a look at this. And this is somebody I've known. And she's just like, let's, you know, let's play this slow. And ultimately it came that I'm glad we did because it's, it's not a good relationship. We really, after asking some hard questions, you're like, ah, okay, maybe this isn't the best thing. But to your question in particular, I'm okay with giving, especially my initial meeting with people, I want to make them, I want to support them. I want to be their friend. I want to try to have a relationship with them and whatever that leads to be for them or for myself, you know, who we'll, we'll wait and see down the road, but I don't know, dude. Yeah. I, I really do try to, to give people the benefit of the doubt. I just think there are too many people in this world who are so quick to judge and so quick to be negative that 
Why can't I be that person who does try to at least see the best in people? Sure. Is there some type of filter that you and I are missing where we probably could say, because here's the thing too, and you and I both experienced this, that sometimes I, it would even be better, not just for us, but even for that other person. Cause you and I have both been in relationships where maybe we've allowed that to go further and longer than we know we should have. We, we were like, Hey, we should have, we probably should have had a harder conversation earlier on in that relationship, but uh, we didn't because we want to, we hate letting people down. We hate being that one to be like, sorry, it's over. Like, Hey, this isn't working out. So I don't know, dude, I, I, I do think like you, I, I like to see the best in people. I'm kind of a loved and lost kind of a guy. I'd rather love and lost than to never have loved at all. And and if I can build a relationship with somebody, even if if later they hate me for some reason, then hey, I look at it and go, we had some great times. Did I? I'll tell you this. I don't even know if we should release this part. We will because I have no filter. Do um, it. But last night I was going through. I have this box in my closet full of stuff that matter. And uh, as things happen, I have every anniversary card my wife's ever given me. Um, I have, and I just put them in this box and I save them cause I like to go back and look at them. And yesterday I found in this box, a letter from this person who absolutely hates me. Um, and the letter mm. is how much I've changed their life for the better and what an amazing human I am. And this letter is just emotional. Like I'm not me if I don't have you and you've just been so amazing to me. And, and I read that and I was like getting some perspective on, that loved and lost thing, like for a while I was huge in her life and I got to be that mm. person that she needed at the time. Her hating me right now doesn't kill the fact that like I did, I did that work, right? And so I wouldn't go back and change anything just because of how things turned out. I feel like, you know, there's good and bad in every situation. And if I can, if I can remember those good things instead of holding on to, you know, how things are now or whatever, it's just easier um, for me. But I don't go back and say, I wish I would have just shut her out of my life or whatever. Like it's, you know, it's, it is what it is. I'll tell you one other thing is I found in that letter and this kind of goes back to Cassidy in that, in that box last night, I just was bawling on the couch and my wife not being sensitive at all to my bawling took a picture and sent it to the kids on Snapchat. Dad's crying um, because the kids love it when I cry because it's often. Um, but Mindy wrote, made me a mixtape in 1994 and wrote me on each of the songs she wrote out why that song explains our relationship. And I was reading this and just bawling. I'm tearing up as I say it. Like, it's like these songs, and I forgot, I remembered all the songs, but I forgot that she had done this. And I, it's four page letter. I'm reading it going, I look at her and I'm like, this is insane. Like you're the same human you were in 90, 94, we got married in 95. But Cassidy gives you an unfair advantage in life. And that's what I feel is Mindy gives me an unfair advantage in life. If you don't have her supporting you, if you don't have her kindly and genuinely, but also um, sweetly saying, you know, we should probably think through, like you have to know how to say that. That's a craft, right? That to be able to say that to you when I've, dude, I, your excitement gets me excited and for a lot of people, when they're around you, it could be like, yeah, what you said, because how do you not, right? You just carry people with you. Um, but for her to be able to go, hang on, like, and with love, help you out, like, it's, it's unfair. Dude, both you and I are incredibly blessed and fortunate to have the spouses that we do. Mine in particular, you nailed it. She really is one of those people. She knows how to approach it because I do... I'm people think I'm almost too enthusiastic sometimes. And especially with something new that I don't even know anything about like art, like owning an archery, like owning a retail company. I had no idea, but I was, I was jazzed and everybody around me, like I got my parents on board and everybody else was excited about it. And she's like, really? Like, but it wasn't like really questioning me. Like you're an idiot. She's like, Hey, I think that's amazing. Like, I know you love these things. What if like, let's, let's think of the, let, what are the next steps? And even as we've approached this, this new technology company that we were working on, she's the, she's the person that again, she's my number one cheerleader. She's my biggest support. At the same time, she's that, she's that opposing force to also make me like, Hey, she's the one that really keeps me grounded in this. Like I, I wish, and it, and it is unfortunate. And like I said, you and I are very fortunate and very blessed to have the spouses that we do and the family that we do. I wish everybody had somebody like that. And, and I know everybody doesn't, mm -hmm. but I, I do think that 
that's one thing that everybody could benefit from, from, from their past lessons, from, from things that they've learned is, is having somebody that can support you in that way, no matter what, even when you have, when you and I have the crazy ideas that we do that we're like, yes, let's do it. Like throw caution to the wind and just have fun and go after it. Mm -hmm. But it's just the way it is. All right. I want to dig into to your shred experience a little bit. Cause I remember the first time I ever yeah. saw you, you were this like young guy I'd never seen before rolling through the, the, it was a conference you were at with a camera. And I was like, what is happening right now? Like we, I, for my first thought was how have we never had somebody like this? Who's like, you know, brings that fresh energy. Um, but also thinks about social media and all that stuff. And then I thought, Oh, that's right. The average loan officer is like 51. Or 53, I think now. So none of us, you know, in the industry had thought about doing what you did. So you did you shut down the mortgage company and then launch Shred? Good. This is actually a really good transition. So my partner and I, we had actually got to a point where we wanted we I had been teaching social media to our loan officers. So him and I and my other and our other partner, we'd all been working on on different aspects. Mine was kind of operations, but mine was almost focused on business growth in the way of social media. That's how I had that's how I was closing loans, dude. I was working on Facebook, I was sharing things, I was creating content. I knew social media well, and I'm like, "Hey, let's take this to the next step. Let's let's build a coaching platform for loan officers." We had both been part of other coaching organizations. Uh, we have both, you know, Rick Ruby, the mortgage marketing animals, other group. I mean, some of the iconic people in the, in the mortgage industry, we have both been coached by, and we just are like, Hey, let's do it a little bit differently. So him and I, him and I and our, and our other partner, we decided like, Hey, let's put a coaching company together. Well, that's, that was the demise of all three of us is we had so many different ideas of what the coaching company should be and how and how it should be structured and organized. We all found out we've been working pretty well in the mortgage company together. Sure. That wasn't perfect. There's no business uh, relationship is, but once we started that, it just fell apart, like literally fell apart. And then we saw some true colors of one another come out. And ultimately all of us, we split, we just said, Hey, I'm going to go. I said, I'm going to go do my own thing. My other partner said, you know, she's going to go do her own thing. Our other partner stayed with the mortgage company because it was originally his, he had brought us on as partners. And so we left and it was, it was incredibly difficult. I went on actually to work with a very short time with, you know, one of your competitors um, and did that for a very short time and then started shred. I actually started a company called the LO life, which that's probably where, that's where a lot of people saw me in the beginning. I was this young punk kid that I was always had a camera with me. I was recording. I just knew there was so much to capture and so much to share because I had met incredible people like you as I was going to conferences, as I was going to different things. I was hearing people's story, but nobody was sharing them on social media. There was great people like David Licken, who's a, both, a good friend to both of us. He is, I consider one of the godfathers of being not only an incredible mentor and advisor, um, somebody who had the Licken on Lending podcast was one of those, was one of the first podcast in the industry, but there was nobody just sharing like the day to day, what was going on in the industry. So I'm like, well, the LO life, let's start the LO life and share that. You so really called that. it the low life. Yeah. The low, I do. I still have a, I could literally run in the next room and grab a hat. I'm going to hold on. Hold on. Okay. Here. See, and for everybody listening, you can see all my high tech. I have a studio, but I tell everybody perfection kills progress. And I'm just using my iPhone on my, here you go, dude. Hashtag. Hello, low life. Life. Dude, we had shirts and hats and like everything around the LO life. Like we were the low life and people would see us at conferences and they're like, low life. What's a low life? And That's anybody so outside hard. the industry, they had no idea what it was, but it, I would go to these mortgage conferences and they're like, LO life, dude. Yes. And so anyway, so there, I literally, that's what people don't believe, but I still save my hats. I'm like you, I crazy side note. Here's my ADHD, my squirrel mentality kicking in. I'm like you, I keep so much stuff going through this moving process and downsizing everything to fit in RV has been one of the hardest things ever. Cause it's like, I have all those cards for my wife. I have like everything I've saved from conferences I've been to, to like a knickknack somebody gave me that was meaningful to me that I've had like, Hey, do I really need this? Like, am I going to put this in storage? Like, so it, it's been interesting, but things like that then are meaningful to me. I, anyway. So yeah, so I start LO life. I'm going to these events. Um, I'm literally reaching out. This is even crazier that I'm uh, on my other screen right here. Dude, this is, this is so tight. I can't believe this is happening. This is one of those moments. 
Uh, I'm going to show it to you here. You guys can see it because I can actually pick it up. You can actually see this was not planned. This is how cool this is. You can see this. This is LO life right here. And these are some of my very first interviews of people on the LO life. And oh my one, of, one of my very first ones, my wife was actually, she's been working on like behind the scenes of taking all of our old LO life content and making sure we have it. And Casey Crawford, owner of Moomin Mortgage, was one of the first people I reached out to. Him and I connected through the outdoor world. No I messaged him. Yeah. And like Casey's his first one right here. And then I have other people who are like Patrick Fitz, Phil Treadwell, Kellen Vaughn, David Kritchmar, Ray, Richard Smith. Oh, David Licken. Look at this. Sure enough, David Licken's on here. So oh all God. these people, I just started reaching out to him, Ken. I'm just like, hey, would you mind taking a few minutes and just coming on and sharing what's going on in your life within mortgage? Like, tell us get some of the ups and downs, kind of like you're doing with this podcast. Mm -hmm. Tell us the good, the bad, and the ugly about it. And I just started interviewing everybody, like anybody who would give me the time of day. I got a lot of no's. A lot of people told me like, no. And people would see me with the hat and the t-shirt on. And they're like, who the hell is this punk kid? And uh, that kind of became my thing, dude. Like that, I would show up to these, I would show up to NBA events and I'm the only guy not where you've seen, you've been a plenty mm -hmm. of those, but especially in the beginning, I was the only guy, especially five years ago, I'd show up to an NBA event. And I remember Bob Brokesmith. I'll hopefully Bob watch it. I'm going to give it because I love Bob. I have so much respect and admiration for him. And Christy Fricko too. Um, they both saw me and Bob even, he's like, Bob's like, I like the hat. Don't know if it fits in here, but I like that you're you. Bob said that was one of the first things Bob oh ever said God. to me. And I was like, Bob, that is the one thing I'm always going to be is I'm going to be unapologetically me. And he's like, I love it. And Bob and I, of course, we became good friends from there. But that was my, that was the thing, dude. LO Life turned into Shred. And here we are. Okay, so Crazy. Shred starts taking off. And I, and I don't know the answer to this yet. So I'm just asking because I don't know where this goes. When, when I started speaking in 03 and started getting gigs and flying around the country talking, um, it was not it was not good for me. Um, and it, it was, it felt amazing and it was great for me. Business was great. Uh, it wasn't great for my personal life because when everybody starts knowing who you are and starts liking seeing you and giving you all that positive feedback, um, I became kind of a jerk. Uh, and when mm. I, I would fly home and Mindy would be like, I need you to do something, you know, in the house. And I'm like, Psh. I never said this, but my attitude was, do you have any idea who I am? Like, <laughs> you know, I can go get all this positive, encouraging stuff. And it happens to every rock band. It happens to every child actor who ends up on, you know, heroin. Um, and I didn't. Uh, but like everybody that finds newfound fame that they hadn't experienced before goes through some sort of challenge. What was your like, you start getting hit up by like people are like, Josh, you're shred. Like, what did that do to you? Vanity. Like I, I, one word is vanity and it got so bad where I was humbled. I was grateful for the opportunity. I was like you, I was being called people what companies were, I was getting back to back to back weekends. There were weeks where I was literally going from one end of the country to the other end of the country spending, I was spending weeks away from the, from home. And it just became, it became, it was difficult on me, on cast, on the kids. Um, I, and thus why we're doing what we're doing now the last couple of years have slowed down, especially with COVID and everything. But there was a time where I was just so full of myself. And it was, I would show up to these events and people are like, oh my gosh, you're Josh, but you're shred. Like you're that guy. Um, and again, it was, it was humbling. But at the same time, I got caught up in the vanity, especially in the world of social media. Not so much in person, like in person, I was still humble to be with people, but I was seeing other influencers on social media who had 100,000 followers, 200,000 followers, 500,000 followers. And I'm like, why can't I like, what am I doing? I need to be that person. And I started talking to people and I started hearing rumors that you could buy followings. Like, Hey, you really want to like, you want to get to hundred thousand followers. Here's how you do it. Like you got to buy a follow. And dude, we had built a pretty, we were like 25,000 followers organically. Like we were doing pretty good, especially in the world of organic growth. And then somebody's like, Oh yeah, dude, work with this company. They'll help you get to a hundred thousand followers. You're going to be getting all these likes. You're going to be getting all these engagement. And I got caught up in the vanity of it all. Like it was all a numbers game. As soon as I did that, Ken, like I, I thought I was the dude. Like over two or three weeks, we hit 50,000 followers, 75,000 followers. And I'm like, let's freaking go. And, and even people were like, oh my gosh, Josh, you're growing so well. Nobody knew I was fake. I was a fraud. Like I was, me and my team were the only ones who knew it. And I was just like, 
at the same time, and even my wife, again, being the maid, she, she kind of, she's like, is it worth it? Like, you're fake. Like, you talk about not being fake and you're doing it. And I was just like, holy shit. I am got caught up in the vanity of social media, of this world. And we made, and just, I mean, just a few months ago, we decided, we stopped working with this company a year and a half ago, quite a while ago. And we actually tried to reclaim our account. That's the best way to, to say it. But because we had paid a company to help us grow, as soon as we stopped using them, our engagement went down, our views went down, and it destroyed our soul. And that, Ken, was even harder than realizing that I was being vain and getting to these. I was like, I'm a, like, nobody gives a shit about me. Like, all these followers I had are fake. Like, all these people that I thought, you know, I was in front of and creating value for, they don't care. And that was a huge moment for me. And I said, it's time, like, we got to shut this down. I want to start over. I want to go back to why I started doing this, which when I first started doing it, it was for, it was for the people that I was serving in the industry, in the mortgage industry, real estate industry. And it's, it's grown outside of that. But I did this because number one, as we went past you and I shared, I love people. I love talking to people. I love helping people when I can. And social media can be a, a tedious task. But if you do it correctly, all you should be focused on is building a community, whether that's 10 people, whether that's 20 people, whether that's 100, 1,000 people, focusing on the people who truly care about you, who truly have your best interest in mind, that's what you're trying to build on social media. You're not trying to get to 100,000 followers. It's not a race of how many views you're getting, how many likes you're getting. You're there to, to impact, impact people's lives every single day. And you can impact people's lives through simple things that you share, through your enthusiasm, through something entertaining, through something you've gone through in the past, that, like we're doing right now. That's what it's all about. It's sharing those experiences. It's sharing those stories. It's sharing the pictures with your wife on a beautiful beach in Maui that I'm like, man, that's amazing. That makes me smile. And that gives me aspiration to do the same thing with my, that's what it's all about. It's not about the numbers. It's not about the vanity. So that was, that was a hard lesson learned. Yeah. How'd you, how'd you get through it? Like, how'd you, cause I imagine you were down in the dumps for a while. We were. Uh, and you, you, I mean, you saw me in those, some of those lowest times where I, I was struggling. I was struggling to what I wanted to do, how I was going to get through it. And ultimately I have an amazing team. I haven't mentioned my team. Dal is, has been, we consider her a daughter, but she has been such an amazing support uh, through all of this. And she was one of the people too. Not only had my wife called me out, but my the Dal on our team, she's like, I think it's time, Josh. Like we've made the mistake at this point. Like, let's just, Let's just rip the bandaid off. Let's start over and let's build something real again. Let's let's build a genuine community, people who you really can make a difference with and make an impact with. And so my team has been the probably the best support. And we've had people come come and go over the years. Dal has always stuck and stayed. She's been through the thick and the thin from when we were at the high of highs doing incredible in business to when we had no clients at all. That that was at a time when we shut down everything. We lost almost all of our clients. Um and it was it was a tough time, but it was it was through our team, and I consider my wife; she was part of that team as well. That that was that enabled us to get through it, and then really taking a look at myself and saying, "Why am I doing this?" It goes to the Simon Sinek: "Why? I, why are you ultimately doing this?" And when I finally sat down and really got broke down my why of why I why am I showing up on social media? Why am I shredding every single day? And realizing that it, it is about people. It is about the, the industry I, I love and care about. It was simple at that point. It's like, okay, we're going to start over and we're going to get through it as a team. Well, I think that you'll be so much better when it's about the right things. Like, because I know it was about the right things in the beginning. I know that that was the deal. And, and like I said, I don't think anybody goes through the type of, of increase in views and increase in, you know, fame and doesn't have something you know, that happens. I think vanity is, you know, you're learning a lesson from it, but it could have been way worse. You know, we both know people that got famous and all of a sudden things just came off the, the, I mean, the wheels came off and everything went crazy. So, so good that you, you know, learned the valuable lesson that you did and like saw that in yourself, because I think that's, I mean, you coach people on social media. What a great 
thing to be able to say is, you know, don't do this. Like, I'm here to tell you this is not the way to go. Yeah. It's funny because I we've even had top producers reach out to us and even say, Hey, I want to get, how do I get to a hundred thousand followers? And I'm like, it's not about that. Like I can tell you from personal experience, if you do that, it will wreck you mentally, emotionally, it will wreck your social profile. Mm -hmm. So do it the right way. Do it. It doesn't matter. Again, if you have a hundred thousand followers or a hundred followers, the people who really care, your community, I call it community, not your clients, not your, even your friends, it's your community. The people, again, who, who have that admiration for you, that's what's important. So yeah, we can coach them on that because I've been through it. I know exactly the experience. So what's your process for like, as the mortgage industry is contracted a ton, um, companies don't have any money. Like it's, it's some do, but for the most part, there's a lot of people shutting down. There's a lot of people, you know, pulling back any spend, um, I mean, we've talked to clients that are not clients, but potential clients who are like, and if, if it involves spending more than 37 cents, we're not interested because all we need right now is to make our, our payroll. And we don't know that we're going to do that. That for us as a training company, you know, training can be seen as optional. Social media, even though it makes them more money, can be seen as optional. As you have clients calling, going, we need to put this on hold or, you know, this is just not something we can afford right now. Being that you are the face of the company, being that Shred is tied to Josh Pitts and Josh Pitts is tied to Shred. And I would never think Shred Dal. I freaking love Dal. And knowing sure. how it all works, Dal is the heartbeat. Like she does so much, but she's not out front. And so a lot of your ego is tied to those things. My ego is tied to, you know, my company. So when you lose a client or one pulls back, I remember when I first started the company, I would take that as a personal, like, I'm not good enough feel. How do you deal with it? It's funny. I, I, I experienced it much of the way you do. I, it's, I feel like it was me personally. I don't feel like it was the company. My team didn't screw up. It was me. And I take that weight on myself. And it's like, what did I do wrong? What could we have done better? And even in the market that, that we're in now, I still take it as a person like, apparently we weren't providing enough value. We weren't doing what we had promised or what we had said we were going to do. So I do take it very personally, which I, I know I shouldn't, especially in the, in the, uh, the, the market that we're in. But uh, at the same time, like to the world of social media, I always tell people, and you and I both know if you're, if you're active on social media, if you're doing the right things consistently, it will help your business grow. It will help your brand grow, help you be out in front of them. But at the same time, people are like, oh, social media, that's just, that's a bonus. Like, I don't have time for social media. We got to focus on, you know, on brick and mortar. I got to focus on the, on the building blocks. But uh, when it comes to a company pulling back or reaching out to us, which we, we have, we've had clients reach out to us recently. Like, hey, you know, I, we can't do this right now. We got to put this on pause. We got to put this on hold. And I, and I, I understand, like, I try to be as sympathetic and, and as empathetic as possible, uh, understanding where they're coming from, because there are companies, there are individuals that are struggling with it. So, um, yeah, uh, but I, I am much like you in the way of like, I, I take it per, probably more personal than I should, especially when the hardest part for both of us, Ken, is, is, this not to sound egotistic. We we know a lot of people in the industry. We're very connected. A lot of the, a lot of our clients are people we're very close with. Our friends we consider friends. And so I almost I try. Especially we got a call from one of our clients recently, and they they own a very large company, and they told us they had to put things on pause. I tried to come from a place of like empathy and understanding. Of like, hey, you're going through something way more difficult. I'm a I'm a very small company considering myself, and I'm like, you know what. I, I totally understand. And I, I want to support you and what you and your company are going through now more than ever. So you can make it through. And if, and if I'm not that, that thing that you need to put on pause, if shred needs to you know, put on pause, so you guys can go out and, you know, get things together and, you know, get back on track to dominating, then, then I understand. I think my mindset has definitely shifted on that recently being that we, you and I have both had good friends go out of business, lose companies completely. So I, I'm trying to be much more empathetic than I was. All right. One last question for you. Uh, one of the lessons I, I could use is uh, negative feedback. So you're out there, you're in public. Um, I know you had it happen in person about your, your shirt and hat when you're going up on stage. I'm sure somebody has said something on social media that uh, is not positive towards you. 
how do you, anybody who's on social media is going to face some troll or, or even somebody saying something accurate that's like, dang, like that's, how do you, how should somebody get through that? Or how have you gotten through things like that? Kill them with kindness. This is something that truly helps me get through it. You shared my, my story. I was wearing a, a shirt and a, and a hat just like this, not this identical one, but I, I wore them to um, one of the premier real estate events in the country. And I had just spoke on stage. I had just got off and this guy comes up to me, prestige real estate agent. He's like, who the hell do you think you are? You young punk, irreverent kid. Who do you think you are? And my, I wanted to just blow this guy up. Like, I just like, I wanted to be like, forget you. Who do you think you are? And I just said, I appreciate you recognizing that I am so different than everybody else. Clearly it stood out to you. And I walked away. Um, and I, and that was hard. Like we got that on film too, which was crazy. Oh um, and the video ended up going, probably my most viral video ever was that. But just recently, this has actually just happened recently. We record, we record a lot of footage. I was speaking at a Momentum Builder event recently. We had a really good uh, clip from it. I posted it and I had this guy uh, who's a friend, who's actually a friend of mine on Facebook. He commented, oh, here's another Gary Vaynerchuk wannabe with his backwards hat thinking he's some badass. Go like He literally put, um, throw this kid in the dumpster and let him burn. And I'm just like, and I, this is, and I screenshot it and I sent it to my team and actually Dal screen, she, she, she saw it before I did. She screenshot it and sent it to me. She's like, did you see this? I'm like, yeah, I did see it. And she's like, don't we know this guy? And I'm like, yeah, we do. Um, and so I ended up sending him a personal message. I didn't, well, you could retaliate. Anybody could be like, you know, oh, you know, Jim, you're in a bad place. Da, 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 da. I didn't even take it to that level. I didn't even delete it. I, I just, um. I ended up commenting. I said, Hey Jim, I, I appreciate your feedback. And then I sent him a personal message. I sent him a video message via messenger on Facebook. And I'm just using Jim. The guy's not name is Jim. I said, Hey Jim, I, I sincerely apologize. If I, if I've done anything to hurt our relationship in the, in, in the past, or I've said something, I, I'm sincerely, you know, I, I apologize. I hope you'll, you'll accept my apology and please let me know if there's anything I can do for you going forward. But, and was sincere. I wasn't trying to be an asshole. I like wasn't coming at it in like a, a confrontational way. I, I, that was said in that tone. He messaged me back and he literally is just like, Josh, I am so sorry. I just got in a huge fight with one of my kids. He wants to move out of the house. I was in such a bad place and it pulled up on Facebook and you were the first video that was there. I am so sorry. He's like, I, I'll delete the comment please forgive me. And I'm like, dude, no worries. I'm like, seriously, I, I didn't reach out for that. I don't want an apology from you. I'm so sorry to hear about your son. Um, I, I can understand how difficult that would be. If there's anything I can do for you, please let me know in the future. And so that was just it, Ken. Like when you, there are trolls and sure, all of us are going to run into trolls in our life. We're just negative people. But for the most part, people have bad days. People have ups and downs. People, you're going to catch people in negative moments and they're going to retaliate just because you are there. And if you're showing up regularly, you're going to show up probably in a way you are benefiting way more people than you're hurting. And even the people who are trolls, you're probably making them think, or you're probably doing something for them. It's on, on one level or another. So don't overthink it. Like the trolls are going to come and go, but remember for every one negative troll, there's 10 other people that you've impacted in a positive way, whether you've seen them or not. And that's the craziest part of social media, whether they've ever commented on one of your posts, whether they've ever liked one of your posts, there are people every single day that see what you post that you have no idea they've seen it. You have no idea that Ken saw your post and it inspired him or he was having a bad day and it, it gave him the strength to get through whatever he was going through. So you know, I, I love that's a perfect way to end because we just earlier talked about maybe everything isn't about us and you found out somebody's comment about you wasn't even about you. It was about the experience they were having. And I did a seminar one time. I didn't know that half the room was suing the other half of the room um, and half the room had left the company that the other half of the room worked for and they hadn't seen each other since this horrible split. Um, and now this is the first time they're seeing each other. And I went home and I'm like, honey, these people hate me. And Mindy's like, what if it's not about you? And that's when I found out they had just, uh, they were suing the other half of the room. So 
it's not always about you. It's about what experience somebody else is having and, and that you don't have to carry that. Dude, I love it. Um, good luck on your trip. I can't wait to see you out here in Portland in your RV. We're going to film. We're thinking about filming a um, Breaking Bad Loan Officer uh, habits um, spoof. So I might need your, need your RV. So definitely, um, I can't Day wait one. to see out here. You can play a role in that. And uh, dude, very helpful. And I'm proud of you. You've done a ton in your very short time. And uh, dude, have a great trip, man. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you. Thank you for everything you've done for me. You've been an incredible friend, mentor, and leader to everybody. So appreciate you, bro. Thanks, man.